Sanatan Dharma is the most universal of faiths. It accepts those who believe in God, who don't believe in God, who want to develop their connection with God through devotion, who want to perform action to elevate themselves to heavenly enjoyments, who want to achieve liberation and merge with God, merge with the light, who want to worship Lord Shiva, who the prime male consciousness, who want to worship Shakti, the prime primary universal female conscious, you know, energy. It allows for all these things. In the Gita, Krishna says, those who want to worship matter, they worship matter and different spirits, Bhutani, Antibuddha, those who worship the devas, they worship the devas. And he doesn't forbid it. Like in the Old Testament, for example, it is forbidden directly. You know, you should not worship other gods before me. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna doesn't condemn that. He says that if you worship the devas, you'll go to the devas. Yanti deva vrata devan. You worship Indra, you'll go to Indra. And what will you do with him? You will come to his heavenly abode within the material universe. And he will say, are you a beautiful apsara? Then I will enjoy with you. Are you a servant? You will serve me. But he doesn't have real sambandha with them. He doesn't have an innate, intrinsic connection with them based on love because he is not the Supreme God. Right? He's just another soul occupying that post of a demigod. But the point is that Krishna doesn't forbid it. He simply says two things. One is that ultimately the worship comes to me. The worship comes to me because ultimately only I can. I am God, Krishna says. So only I can bestow the fruits of your worship. And I ultimately am the only one who receive your worship. And the examples given by our charis is that Imagine, you know, you put mail in the post box and the person who picks it up considers themselves the supreme enjoyer of that mail. They'll get fired. They're not the enjoyer of that mail. They're a servant. They have a job to pass it on. So God is the supreme enjoyer. Every, if the mail is addressed to God, a demigod does not enjoy that. God is the supreme enjoyer. Ishwara Parama Krishna, the Supreme Personality is Krishna. But Krishna allows for the worship of different demigods, for those who desire material results. He allows for it. He doesn't forbid it. He doesn't say, I will kill you if you worship them. He allows it. So it's very broad. Right? But also Krishna recommends what will most please the Atma. In the Bhagavatam, it says, Yoyatma Suprasiddhati. We can be satisfied on the physical level, the mental level, the physiological level, right? The bodily, mental, psychosomatic level, we can have some satisfaction. But because it doesn't satisfy the Atma, there's a deeper thirst that is unquenched that causes us to continue seeking higher levels of fulfillment. <clears throat> And there's two paths. There's the Nivriti Marg, Pravriti Marg. Nivriti Marg is the path of renunciation of sense gratification. Because, again, the inner fulfillment is not being met. And then there's Pravriti Marg, which is to satisfy your senses until you become ultimately completely exhausted. So, generally, human beings will do that through intoxications in Tamagun, mode of ignorance, Rajagun, mode of passion through sex life. If you're in complete tamagun, you can't even have sex life. You know, you see, if you see complete crack addicts and meth, meth heads on the, the deepest lows of the lows, there's no even calm. It's just complete darkness of ignorance. But it's not satisfying the needs of the innate self, the Atma. But the Praviti Marg allows for that, even in Hinduism. In the second chapter, third chapter, fourth chapter, Krishna will say, Perform karma yoga. Enjoy the results of your sacrifices. Sahaya yagya prajasristva. Enjoy. So Hinduism covers that, allows for it. It's very broad in its conception. Those who are logicians, there's a school of Hinduism for that. There's the six philosophies, six darshans. It allows for it all. It doesn't uh, discriminate and criminalize 
different modes of being. It actually understands them as part of spiritual evolution. And so it is accepting. <clears throat> That's why if you look at the four goals of human life, according to Vedic teachings, it's mostly related to the first three are material needs. Dharma is religious principles that uphold society so that you have a place with which you can earn and enjoy. If you're living in a complete anarchic place with no principles of Dharma, no law, no order, no opportunity, then what is the question of Artha and calm? Artha means economic development. Communism means what? No Dharma. There's no Dharma there. So there's no Artha. <laughs> no one can accumulate wealth. Only Hiranyakashipu can have wealth. Whether it's one person or the Politburo or whatever it is. No Dharma, so how are you going to enjoy? That's the, the, the sales pitch. You'll enjoy more. Everything will be equal. Yes, that's what they tell you when they're putting you into the prison. We were joking yesterday, you know, when if communism ever takes over in America, it's not going to be the bread line, it's going to be the M&M line. <laughs> you have to get in line for your M&Ms. That's what we do at Walmart, right? Anyhow, I'm going off topic now. The point is that why am I mentioning that? I'm not getting into politics. The point is that without most people are doing Dharma so they have a stable environment so that they can acquire wealth and enjoy. And these are goals of human life. And the Vedas don't criminalize that. Do it. No problem. Gradually you elevate. People say, Hindus aren't vegetarians. They don't have to be vegetarians. And if you look at it, the majority of Hindus, I don't know exactly the metrics, the demographics, but a lot of them aren't vegetarian. Most of them don't eat cows. Some even, Brahmins, will eat cows <clears throat> in some places and say, I'm Hindu, I'm a Brahmin, you must worship me, caste system. We don't accept that. But in the scripture it says, if you cannot curb that tendency, then do it according to scriptural regulations. Therefore, you have kosher in the Judaic tradition. Christians, do we have any regulation around it? Eat anything? <laughs> I hear a joke about someone says, like Catholics, like, don't eat fish on Fridays, but if you do, it's okay. <laughs> I, I don't know the, the rules about it. They changed. Islam, they have rules, at least, right? Uh, has to be, uh, what's it called? No pig, but they have a rule for it, halal, right? Is the halal, there's rules around preparing the meat, or there's just no pig involved? Anyhow, I don't know the specifics, but the point is, that's better than just eating meat without some religious principles. Muslims are eating meat according to their religious principles. Jews are eating meat according to their religious principles. Christians are eating meat according to their religious principles, which is, you know, Christ is very merciful. <laughs> that's, the, that's the principle. The point is that Hinduism is very broad. Dharma is very broad. But the scripture says we only allow that to gradually curtail it because if you criminalize it you know like we had the prohibition area in the US right made a lot of good movies <laughs> good stories right Al Capone the point is that this is all based on karma this is all the three gunas goodness passion ignorance and it's all essentially suffering various levels of suffering and when Krishna says in the Sastra, or when the Sastra describes, Savai Pungsam Paro Dharma Yato Bhakti Radhoksaje Ahaitukiya Pratyata Yatma Supersiddhiti, what he's speaking of is the ultimate aim, or the ultimate fulfillment. Paro Dharma. And so it's considered that when we talk about Dharma, if the highest Dharma is not ultimately represented, then all the other steps of the ladder of Dharma are futile, useless. It's not the conception of the Vedic sages that, okay, eat meat and take wine and have many wives and enjoy and this and that, and that's Hinduism. 
Hinduism means polytheism and what else? Poly, what do you call it? Many wives? Oh, polygamy. Yeah. And then <laughs> if you don't want to do polygamy, then polyamory. This is Hinduism. To have many wives is to be a Hindu. It's allowed under certain prescriptions, but it's not the ultimate aim. What is the ultimate aim? Without that, Gurudev would say in the Bhagavad Gita, karma, jnana, and bhakti are three stages of the same process. And the scriptures say bhakti ultimately is the fifth and it, uh, it is the sadhana to achieve the fifth and final goal, which is prema, divine love. And prema dharma is the highest goal of sanatana dharma because it fulfills the soul on a spiritual level. Now the point is, Indra, Agni, Vayu, all the material demigods cannot fulfill that need. If you worship Indra, you can have more enjoyment. If you worship Saraswati Devi, you can have more knowledge. If you worship Durga, for each demigod, you can get a specific result. But all these demigods are within the material universe. They're all within the material universe. Nirgun, the transcendental Lord, is beyond. The transcendent, beyond, you know, we see like, look at, this is our universe here, right? You look around, we have this meadow, we have these buildings where we live, where we're sheltered. We have the sky above, you have the trees, you have the earth below. And we all see it according to our perception and describe it in various ways. That's all material universe. Anything that you can see with matter is matter. The eyes are material, so you see material things. The unseen seer ultimately is what is connected to God. And the Sasha ultimately it aims at connecting the Atma with Paramatma, the soul with the super soul. But going back to our previous topic, unless you allow people to progress through Dharma Arta Kam, how will they go beyond moksha even? Moksha means liberation. We didn't talk so much about that. People want freedom from suffering. You go through either mark, right? I'm going to enjoy as much as possible until I become materially exhausted. Or I'm going to renounce everything. Both of them aren't considered ultimately a spiritual goal. They're all, again, just within this material paradigm. So that's why it said pancham purushartha. The real highest goal is on the atma level. On the Atma level, there's also two primary paths. One is impersonal, one is personal. If you want to cease to personally exist, usually that's a reaction to extreme suffering. And so, therefore, it's also not considered ultimately fulfilling to the Atma. It negates a problem. We've talked about that in the other class. We talked about uh, painkiller spirituality. How any kind of spirituality that's just a painkiller for a material kind of suffering is not genuine spirituality. Because spirituality should connect to the spirit, which is transcendental. It's not located in a material paradigm. Otherwise, how is it possible? Krishna says, when the body is slain, the soul is not slain. How is it possible that Krishna says, that person that he thinks he is the slayer or that he is slain are both an illusion because they don't understand what is the self, the he. The body is slain, but the atma is not. That means the atma is not on a material platform. And so sanatan dharma, the eternal dharma, is related to that which is eternal. Our Param Gurudev, Guru's Guru, his favorite verse in the Bhagavad Gita, as it's described, one of the favorite verses is how you differentiate between matter and spirit. All that is material is temporary. All that is spiritual is eternal. Therefore, Tatvadarshi, those who see the truth, are those who are able to differentiate between matter and spirit. And then see that spirit present within all beings. So this is the expression of that spirit in this temporary form according to our karmas and our desires, our vasanas, our desires, our samskars, our impressions, and our karmas that are fructifying, that are to be fructified, and it's all a tangled web. That's why it's called maya and sangsara, tangled web. How to unravel that web? Therefore, Krishna says you can try to do it through karma, fruit of action, but the more you do it, the more tangled it gets. If anyone's ever tried to untangle 
you know, like a really, really tangled up ball of thread and you think you'll pull it tighter and that'll free it, that's karma. You know, you get a really jumbled up, mixed up ball of thread. You think, I'm just going to pull it tighter. That's karma, karma mentality. Or gyan mentality, I'm going to untangle it. But it's so tangled up. You imagine millions of lifetimes of tangled up karma. How many lives are you going to work on untangling it? You could spend another thousand lives. And in the meantime, because you're bound to do karma, you're going to be tangling yourself back up in the meantime. So while you're working on untangling a million lifetimes, you may get a, you know, you may get over a few hundred while you're increasing it by, you know, who knows? What is the process of bhakti? We heard it from our Gurudev. Bhakti burns the rope of karma much faster, <laughs> right? Bhakti just burns the rope of karma. So that's your question, right? The subtle form may remain because you still have a material form, this body, which is your past karma manifest. That is this body. This body is the fruit of our karma. But the power of bhakti is that it burns the karmic reactions. And so the body remains like the rope remains, but it has no power to bind. If you truly follow the path of bhakti, with, and what is the beginning of the path of bhakti? You develop, devote, Krishna says it very simply, devotion. But devotion has stages. The first seed is faith, desire to know and be with God, desire to serve and love God. Then that develops to the mood of surrender, and that develops through saintly association. And then you follow the practice of spiritual life to gradually dissolve your tendencies of karma, because you can burn the rope, just like, you know, you can burn down a tree. But what happens? The seeds in the ground will come up. What happened in our, we had our frozen flower beds, right? We had all these frozen flower beds and then we thought all the plants died. What happened in the spring? The seeds germinated and sprouted. So therefore, bhakti, the more difficult than burning your karma is the tendency. So I would say that part of the reason it may seem like we're still experiencing karma and some suffering is so that it will help us burn through the tendency to perform that, those karmic activities. Because it's not just karma we're dealing with, it's pop, bij, the seed for sinful desires, suffering, causing suffering to others, enjoying what is not ours, and so on. And then what else? Abhiman, Ego, pride. People ask, what is a demon? Demon just means personification of ego and pride in rebellion to God. Rebelling against the principle of the good and supreme, divine. So anyhow, the point is that Sanatan Dharma leads us to that platform of what is Sanatan, eternal. And if that is not the primary aim. So if you look at all the religions in the world, even if they're living on different karmic levels or different gunas, goodness, passion, ignorance, eating meat, and so on and so forth, the Dharma still teaches them to aim at God. Right? And that's why in the world, all the monotheistic traditions are still more beneficial to society than not having any religion at all. By far and away. Even if they're still... Now people blame... Now this is a debate. Okay, you know, but terrorists are Muslims and Hindus are Hindu-phobes and Christians are bigots and this and that. You have to understand that the religion is a medicine for a people who are on a certain karmic level. Imagine what it would be without that medicine. <sighs> right? Don't blame the doctor and the medicine because the patients are still suffering their malady. Right? This is a very complicated discussion. You know, why don't they prohibit certain acts and so on and so forth? I'm not getting into the tangled web of this topic, but I'm giving you a general overview. Any dharma is better than no dharma. In the scripture it said, a bad king is better than no king. Because when there's no king then all the subjects become prey to rogues and thieves and very dangerous people. So a bad king has the ego of being the king 
and generally they want to maintain that ego. They don't want a revolution against them. <laughs> and so they may have taxes and this and that. But anyhow, the point is that dharma is better than adharma. Even as it's a gradual progression. But all dharmas that don't lead to the ultimate transcendental being and that revelation of the transcendental self. And if they don't propose that and help you progress towards that, it's considered futile. So that's also there. So not the dharma has all the checks and balances. Right? I'll give you an example. Um, well, it's a, there's a few examples, but I would say the most famous example to show this point is the inception story to the Srimad Bhagavat, Bhagavat Puran, where the compiler of all Vedic knowledge, the tree of all knowledge, is dissatisfied with all of his literature. Ved Vyas, in the very beginning, is described to be dissatisfied. Right? I have not achieved my aim. Yatma supersidity, the inner fulfillment had not been met. And so his guru, Nadad, came and Nadad said, Oh, I see that you are not happy. How is it possible? You've written all the Puranas, all the Upanishads, all the Veda. And so people say, Okay, but, you know, if the Bhakti Sastra seems newer, this is an argument that goes on. Oh, the Bhakti Sastra seems newer. And the Vedic literature, the more ancient literature, doesn't talk so much about Krishna or Vishnu, even though it's there. There is Rig Veda texts speaking about the nature of Goloka, referring to Brindavan, Krishna. There's verses, but it's subtle. Why? Because people in their lower stages of evolution, they need the local gods that are touched with material nature. The god of the fire, the god of the water, the god of the air, the god of the rain, the god of the thunder. Why? Because humankind needed food. <laughs> and they were suffering and struggling with monsters and demons, whatever they call them. And so they would pray to God as they could understand it, and then life would get better. They would work hard, do their dharma, and pray to whatever God they could understand. They would pray to something that represented the good. Right? Represented the good. Indra, as the king of the material heaven, represents... As a, is a representative of Lord Vishnu, who is himself, what do we call representative? An avatar, Shaktavesh, Manvantar, and, and so on and so forth. Gun avatar. So many levels, right? So they pray to what represents the good. To them, on the local level, the material level. Because they have material needs, and so that's okay. But Krishna says, ultimately, I receive that, I take that, and I give the fruits. So what is maintaining law and order, right? We have the police. What is protecting the police? What is protecting those people and those people and those people and those people? That is what is called dharma. We live in a dharmic nation to some degree. Otherwise, we'd be in complete chaos with no chance for artha, no chance for calm, no chance, what chance for moksha? Moksha is there. Why? The more you're tormented by demons, maybe you can just go run away and pray for moksha. But even that's difficult. Why? What do the demons do? Kamsa, Hiranyakashipu, Ravan, they forbid any sacrifice, any yagya to God. They say, nope. Outlaw it. That's what they do. And then they kill the cows, and they kill the Brahmins, and they destroy the Vedas. Again and again and again, Hiranyaksha, the great demon of Satya Yuga, he hid all the Vedic knowledge. And he put the earth down into a more unconscious, ignorant kind of level. Right? And then it was lifted up by Vrahadev. And then the next demon came, Hiranyakashipu, and then the Shringadev. One after another after another, the battle wages on. The point is, anyhow that people are praying and worshipping to the good, the supreme, the divine, the transcendental. Like right now, you could say, we say Indra is the local demigod. But where is he now? Can you see him? He's still transcendental to us. That means he's beyond the range of our mental physical perception. Correct? By Vedic knowledge, by our gurus, we understand that he is still a material demigod. Vayu, Indra, Agni, so on and so forth. But if we pray, we can connect to something beyond us that can, if we propitiate it, it can help us. 
So anyhow, I'm just giving a general explanation so that I can bring us to the focal point, which is our Gurudev and our specific path. You understand? This is tying into your question, his question. You can pray to everybody. How is it going to benefit you? Because what we are following ultimately is something very specific. Very specific. And our Gurudev is our connection to that thing that is very specific. Everything be achieved, everything beyond moksha, self realization, Ayodhya Dham. Gurudev had some disciples who he said, You are eternal associate of Lord Ram. I will bless you in that. Just like Lord Chaitanya had associates who were associates of Lord Ram, and he blessed them. Our Gurudev was very specific, again, again, again. But yet, he had disciples I've met who were associates of Lord Ram. And he said, Very good, you will be with Lord Ram in Ayodhya, the eternal abode of Ram. Nice. He said, how glorious you are. You will leave samsara and be with the eternal Lord Ram in his abode. And that personality of Lord Ram is eternal and he exists and you can be with him. And that will fulfill your atma. That will fulfill your need. So when Ved Vyas was writing the Vedas, the, he still wasn't satisfied. That's my point here is that people say, oh, the Bhakti texts, they are later editions. No, they were written after. That's why it's called Nigama Kalpataror Galitam Phalam. The ripened fruit of the tree of Vedic knowledge is the Bhagavatam. And what is the essence of the Bhagavatam? Ras Panchadhyay. What is that Ras Panchadhyay? Ultimately, the love between the soul and God. How do you link with God through divine love? Bhakti Yoga. The Yatma Suprasiddhiti. That satisfies the highest and the deepest need of every soul. So that is real Sanatana Dharma. So our Gurudev is leading us towards that highest consideration. Be very focused. Like for example, many people want to love Krishna and be with Krishna directly. Gurudev would say in the mood of Raghunath Daska Swami, satyam. I don't even aspire for direct meeting with Krishna. I offer pranam, obeisance to that. I don't even want to be the direct friend of Sri Radha. I simply want to serve her. Sir Kinkari, the servant of the servant of the servant. That mood is there, therefore that mood is very powerful. You know, Prabodhananda Sarisvatipad, he said, I would rather be a dog in Vrindavan, taking the remnants of Madan Mohan, than being a queen in Dwarka. <laughs> what an audacious statement, right? Than being a maidservant of a queen in Dwarka. Why? Because of his exclusive devotion. So for him, it's not a fault. For us, we cannot criticize. But for him, it's not a fault because our aim is very specific. So my point is that without our Gurudev, how do we connect to this universal conception? We are not connected. We are disconnected. All on the mental level. It's all just on the mental level. When we are connected, then spiritual birth begins. Then the umbilical cord of the nourishment from the divine realm enlivens us, nourishes us, gives birth to the soul, gives strength and nourishment to the soul. So therefore, ultimately, our Guru, who is like our Shiksha Guru, he always focuses on Guru Bhakti. He says, without Guru Bhakti, everything else is, you're unrelated to it. You understand? You're just outside the honey jar licking the glass. And then you get to satisfy that, so you go and become a preacher. <laughs> and you go and preach about the honey without ever having tasted it. Radharani calls those people cheaters. In Prem Samput, she says anyone who's describing this without having relished any of it, a little bit of it, they're just a cheater. Not satisfied licking the jar, so you think maybe I'll be satisfied being a guru talking about what I don't understand, haven't relished, haven't realized. So that's also just suffering. But the point is, um, without connection, how are we getting that relishment? How are we tasting it? How are we receiving it? How are we developing it? We cannot. So our Shiksha Guru says, Guru Bhakti is topmost. But Guru Bhakti is not to one person. Right? Guru Bhakti means, in our line, we understand Sri Radha is the highest Guru. 
and our lineage is all connected to her and receiving, just like I mentioned, the same thing with the demigods and gods. As soon as Indra tried to imitate Krishna or tried to oppose Krishna's will, he was humbled. As soon as Brahma did the same, he was humbled. And even in battle, Lord Shiva showed he was subordinate to Krishna. In the 11th canto, uh, the t- end of the 10th canto, towards the later part of the 10th canto of Bhagavatam, Krishna defeats Lord Shiva. Because Lord Shiva wanted to show Krishna supreme. Even though he is the angsa of Krishna, extension of Krishna, he is touched with material energy. So he is not on the Nirgun platform, transcendental platform. So Krishna is supreme. So my point here is that with gurus also, if we have too much fanatic devotion towards the idea of guru in this form and don't understand them as a link to an eternal lineage that is ultimately linking to the eternal ashraya tattva, then how are we going to receive nourishment? Ashraya tattva means the ultimate shelter. And that ultimate shelter within Gaudiya Vaishnavism is either Balaram or Shirata. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And then there's the Balaram Tattva and the Radha Tattva appearing from his right side and his left side. Balaram from the right side, Radha from the left side. And so all those who come into that lineage, the Akanda Guru, the undivided principle of Guru is Lord Balaram, the Servitor Godhead, or Shirata, the energy of the Lord. And for those who are desiring relationship with Krishna in the mood of a beloved, to taste that Madhuya, romantic divine love, then they will take shelter of Shirata. For those who are looking for it on a more fraternal level, or even a paternal level, they'll approach through Balaram. And the Guru is simply one connected in that chain of succession to those divine servitor personalities of Godhead. It's called Ashraya Jatiya, Bhagavan. God in the form of the shelter, the supreme shelter. Radha, Krishna. Krishna, Balaram. Gora, Nitai. Always that is there. So for us, again, it all comes back to Guru Bhakti. In our line, specifically, if we want that highest aspiration without that Guru Bhakti, how will we connect? For us, specifically, in our mission, that is our Srila Bhaktivedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj, and before him, Srila Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Before him, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada. Srila Gokshadas Babaji Maharaj. Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Srila Jagannath Das Babaji Maharaj. Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur. Srila Nartam Srinivas Shaman in the Purus. The Six Goswamis. Lord Chaitanya. The Panchatattva. We connect to that specific line. Therefore, when we do Jaya Dwani, we pray to them. Right? When we pray in the Jaya Dwani, the prayers after the morning, the evening, midday programs, we're praying to our link, our connection, to that channel, to that divine spirit. Otherwise, I am an orphan on the mental level talking about spiritual life. Right? Just on the mental level. And people love the mental platform. (laughs) So we can speculate and obfuscate, ruminate, and steepen our thoughts. But it's not ultimately nourishing you on the spiritual level. That's why ultimately Kirtan Harikata is not on the material platform. And ideally, the goal is to hear from someone who is also in that time not on the material mental platform. It may not be purely on the spiritual platform, but at least if they're aiming towards the spiritual platform, it can be beneficial. Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Goswami Maharaj would say in his book, Guru and His Grace, there may be three levels of gurus. One who has both feet in this world, but is very clearly aiming at the spiritual world, is progressing towards that and leading other people sincerely towards that. First level. Second level, one foot here, one foot there. Third, highest level, both feet there. Out of mercy, they appear here and they help people. And those are generally great personalities who found a specific branch or are great personalities uh, continuing a branch of the Sampradaya. Right? That's called the Uttam Mahabhagavat, the eternal associate of the Lord. For us, that is our beloved Gurudev. Without him, uh, this essential, innermost heart's desire, the message of Lord Chaitanya, could be lost in the Western world. Swami Prabhupada gave it everywhere. But he gave it and asked his dear associate to come and continue 
to share this knowledge and to refine people's understanding and to help them in the practice of it to actually achieve the supreme goal because it said if in every generation someone does not achieve that then again the line can get lost so in every generation someone has to achieve at least someone has to achieve the goal that the spiritual masters present to the world and therefore they say if at least one person achieves that goal their mission is successful because the torch will remain lit for at least one more generation and that's why Krishna says ultimately I again appear the gurus again appear because it's necessary right but what I'm mentioning here is that generally if we see that's called Bhagavat Parampara there's a debate between the Gaudiya line of Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada and other lines and it's over this topic of Bhagavat Parampara we don't have time to get into the details now but essentially Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada said the pure devotees of the Lord who specifically carry the innermost heart's desire of their predecessor in their heart and serve their mission by carrying it out in this world and distributing it in this world they are considered Bhagavat Paramparacharyas. And then, in whatever gaps there may be or whatever followers and disciples there may be, the unbroken line will continue through the Diksha Parampara. That means those who are in the role of spiritual master as a priest, who are giving the mantra, who are giving the initiation, and who are giving the sadhana, the practice, and by their faith in that lineage that is eternal, that is divine, that is transcendental, and their faith in the connection to the transcendental source, not to being that, to be a servant of that, then that line is continuing in that way. When we say, Tat Tuamasi, I am the servant of God, that is what it means. And to be the servant of God, I must be also made of spirit. Right? That's what it means. I am the servant of God. To be the servant of God, I am not matter, I am spirit. So, Aham Brahmasmi, I am spirit. Therefore, in the scripture it says, Na deva devam archiyat. How can you be a servant of God if you are not made of spirit? A rock is not serving a human. A human may use a rock, but the rock isn't having devotion and love for the human being who is using it. <laughs> right? Anyhow, the point is, Na deva devam archiyat. Tattvamasi, I am that. That means I am a servant of God. Because I am the part of the whole. So my nature is to love and serve the supreme whole. In doing that, what will I do? <sighs> this is the beauty of it. The beauty of Bhakti Yoga. To realize God, you must be transcendentally situated. So Krishna says, I will lift you up to the transcendental platform. If you have that desire to come to me, I will uplift you from the ocean of suffering and material existence. Therefore, in 2.46 of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says what? If you really want the highest spiritual fulfillment, no need to worship the different demigods. You don't need to go to many different wells for many different needs. Go to the reservoir. Go to Krishna. Go to the all-attractive source from which all the water comes. That's why this example is given. Why do you know you go to this well for this need, you go to this demigod for that need, this demigod for that need, you have some Hindus, which is good, good, bona fide, Hindus. I worship 20 demigods before lunch because I need Ganesh to give me money, I need Saraswati to give me learning, I need Lakshmi to give me fortune, different levels, you know, Ganesh to remove my obstacles, Saraswati to give me fortune, Indra to give me good sex life, and you worship them all, Surya and so on and so forth. But Krishna says, if you want the soul level to be satisfied, fulfilled, you don't need to go to the well, go to the source of the water. Go to the reservoir. Go to Krishna. And that's ultimately the message of the Bhagavad Gita. Therefore, it's also considered the highest Upanishad. Sarva Upanishad Ghavo Dagda Gopala Nandana. The Bhagavad Gita is the essence of all the Upanishads. And the Bhagavatam is the ripened fruit of all Veda, all knowledge. And so if you study those, it came second on purpose by the author. So in the construct of material time, past, present, and future, this was written, then this was written. But on the eternal platform beyond material time, past, present, and future, that message is eternal, that process is eternal, the lineage, 
the undivided principle of Guru is eternal, the Supreme Being is eternal. It all exists outside of material time and material duality, material existence. Therefore, it is an atheist consideration to say, when did this scripture get written? When did that scripture get written? They can understand it, but Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada would call, he would say, these lexicographers, he would use that word, become like the Putanas, the demonous witches which suck the life out of the infant spiritualists. Because everything is mundane, everything is, everything is seen through the prism of their atheistic rebellion or their general malaise or whatever it may be. But it's colored by their own perception and generally what happens is that there's some form of envy towards those who have genuine love and devotion. Hey, silly, stupid, specter. Oh, people who practice bhakti are fools. Women and children, that's what they say. Bhakti is for women and children. Yes, good. And for those men who are not over intelligent, demonic, atheistic jerks. <laughs> right? It's for every human being, really. But People will scoff, oh, bhakti. Bhakti is for sentimentalists. Bhakti is for those who don't have knowledge. Bhakti is for those who can't do karma. Bhakti is for those who are weak. No. Bhakti is for those who are sumedasa, spiritually intelligent. That is who it's for. Those who have spiritual intelligence practice bhakti. And what is the essence of our limb? We'll end with this. So we're connected through our Gurudev. But in this age, what do we say? Yajanti hi sumedasa. Those who are intelligent will perform that yagya, sacrifice to God, which is the chanting of his holy names. Harer nama, harer nama, harer nama, eva kevalam, kalo nasteva, 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 gatiranyata. That is the way. So therefore we come together and we chant. So there are a thousand branches of the Vedas said you can enter the ocean of Vedic knowledge without a navigator you get lost and bewildered but with a navigator the navigator will ask you where do you want to go oh that is your aim I'll chart you a course and we'll go in that direction and our line our ship isn't one of those vessels that you can hire and say I want to go there take me there I want to go to Indralok, take me there. This ashram, take me to Indraloka. No, we're a ferry that only goes to one place. That is Goloka Vrindavan. Okay? We don't go to other places. If you want to go to Shiva Loka, there's many gurus who have their transcendental navy, their ships, that will take you to Shiva Loka. Right? That is not our... We have a chartered route in our lineage directly to Goloka Vrindavan. If you want to get off on the Ayodhya stop, you can. If you want to get off on the Dwarka stop, you can. Mathura stop, you can. But outside of, you know, the Vaikuntha planets and devotion to the Lord. Because many people are liberated who don't have devotion to God. Because if God only allowed you to be liberated if you had devotion to Him, what kind of jealous God would He be? So again, Sanatana Dharma is very broad. You want to be liberated without devotion to me? Achieve it. Annihilate your individual self. Merge in the impersonal absolute. Go for it. Many have achieved that. Many are there. This is the goal. Moksha without relationship. Good. But that is not our chartered. We are not uh, chartered, you know, skippers And for that aim. When you get on our Gaudiya Vaishnav vessel, in our lineage, we have one destination. From Maya to Goloka. Right? From wherever you join, you know, whether you join from Calcutta or Delhi, Vrindavan or New York or Florida or any other Radha Krishna temple in our Gaudiya Vaishnav lineage, no matter where you get on, whatever port there is, from that port, you know, it's like a non stop route, go to Goloka Vrindavan. No need to stop off in Indraloka and suffer there. No need to suffer in. Bhur, Bhuvaswa, the different talas and, and, you know, talas and lokas. No need. 
Direct route. That's why Vam and Dave. What did Vam and Dave do? I am the Lord. Three steps. One, two. Cover the upper regions, the lower regions, seven higher planetary systems, seven lower planetary systems. With the step that went to the upper planetary systems, he pierced through the material universe and the transcendental source, the Lord's causal ocean beyond, came in and he said, ultimately, you can go there. How? Where do I place my third step? Bali said, place it on my head. So that one step is in the spiritual world and then he placed the second step on his head and then he took him to the spiritual world. That is our process here. This is not speculation. This is not sentimentalism. This is factual. Not according to my opinion. Not according to my arguments and my logic. But this is what is Sanatan. This is our line of Lord Chaitanya, Sri Krishna, according to all the Vedic literature, according to all the realized sages, according to all our gurus, according to our process. And if you have doubt, no problem. We are not uh, verified by your belief or disbelief. But if you want to experience this and you want to practice it and gain some result, follow the process. Simple. Follow the process. Shravanam kirtanam vishnu smaranam padasevam dasam achan vandanam sakyam atmani vedanam eti pungsar pita vishnu bhagavad chenna valakshana krita bhagavati datan manye ditamud. This is the highest knowledge, but Rupa Swami says, Pratamam Guru Padishrai, Tasmat Krishna Hiridikshedi Shikshanam, Sadhu Vartmanu Vartamanam, and so on, Bhajana Kriya and Arjuna Riti, everything must be followed according to its proper amount, according to your condition. Therefore, there's a general recommendation and there's a specific application. Understand? Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, Madhuri Kadambini, Jaiva Dharma, Dasamula Tattva, all the general recommendations are there. Without a doctor, they can't give you a specific formula that you need in your specific circumstances. So that is some topic for today. We'll end with that and go to our Arati. Thank you for your time. Hare Krishna. Vanchi kalpa tribhisu kripa sindhu vevacha patita anang pavanibhyo vaishnavibhyo namo namah Hare Krishna.